Hello everyone, today is Thursday, November 3rd, 2016. This is the week in charts. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often say, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Yeah, you don't want to see me. <laughs> I actually turned on my webcam. I would have gotten dressed if I'd have known. Put some pants on. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Okay. Let me make sure I'm turn this webcam uh around just in case <laughs> i'd have claimed my office had i known too all right what we talk about well as usual let's talk about current market conditions uh your questions on trading obviously your favorite stock picks you do the show naked <laughs> well i i refuse to answer that on the grounds that it might incriminate me uh, all your stock picks if you don't mind Wait until uh, we get to the actual charts as opposed to the slides. And then uh, when we do get there, just ask about one stock at a time. You can ask about as many as you want. In fact, uh, I encourage you to ask about as many as you want. So what are we going to talk about this week? Well, this week I want to talk about the real secret of trading, part two. And the secret is, and it's not that exciting, but it's patience. And it's amazing how important patience is when it comes to trading. So last week we talked about the fact that there's two forms of patience, and we focused on the patience to wait for your pitch. And I mentioned the patience to let things unfold once you take the setup. So let's do a little recap on part one. Now here's some quotes from last week. I spent a lot of time researching things we ultimately don't do. And that's been me lately, going through charts over and over and over and over and over again, and then telling my clients, hey, guys, I can't find anything and not doing anything. And that's tough sometimes. But the reason you have to keep doing that is because you never know when that next big opportunity is going to come along. As I've said quite often, we had two decent winners this year, one of which we're still on. And they both came a day after someone said, hey, Dave, I'm taking a break because I don't see any setups in the foreseeable future, and neither did I. But you have to keep doing that research because you never know when those next big winners are going to come along. And it is important because it is a game of outliers, and we're going to touch upon that again in a little while. Doing nothing is harder than it looks. Ken Lambert, and then, of course, it takes character to sit there with all that cash and not do and do nothing. I didn't get to where I am by going after mediocre mediocre opportunities. And we're going to talk about mediocre opportunities here in just one second too, and avoiding them obviously. And then of course Tom Petty said it best: "The waiting is the hardest part." And it is hard to wait. It's hard to wait going into a trade, and it's hard to wait once you're in a trade. But as I often say. Give me someone who's patient any day over someone who's smart when it comes to trading. And who was it? Uh, William Eckhart, I think, said average intelligence is enough. Not to digress too far. Now, last week we talked a little bit about why successful people have trouble trading. And I've been wrestling with that question for a long time. So finally I asked it in a webinar. And then a couple days later I got my answer. And the, the clincher in the answer was, or the most pertinent part was, we have no trading to prepare us for sitting on our hands and waiting. It is simply not part of our mindset. So Dr. J, who's a psychiatrist, was telling me that they have to take whatever train wreck comes along. So they're not trained to sit around and wait for the perfect pitch, the so-called perfect pitch. And that's one reason that successful people like yourself have trouble trading because your current or prior career has taught you to take whatever's thrown at you, whatever issue, and then deal with it. Whereas in trading, you have to wait a lot of times. Now, just to recap real quick, you need to ask yourself when you're looking at your charts, can you walk away and be okay? Now, if conditions are generally conducive to trading, meaning that the stock you're looking at is going up, it's in a nice persistent trend, a nice accelerating trend, you've got a nice little TKO pattern, or it might be an emerging trend where you have a bow tie or a first thrust, these patterns that we talk about 
week in and week out, setting up. The sector looks good. Stocks within the sector also look good. And that's very important, too. Sometimes you have an overall sector that looks okay, but you dig a little further to the sector, you'll find that they're not, the stocks within the sector aren't that great. The overall market's looking pretty good. And obviously, again, the stock itself looks pretty good. So if everything is lining up, then there's only one thing to do, and that one thing is to trade. But if conditions aren't generally conducive, let's say the overall market looks like electrocardiogram, like now. Let's say most sectors look like electrocardiogram, like now. The sector you're looking at is either dubious or sideways at best, probably like now, as we'll see when we get to the charts. Then you have to ask yourself another question. Do you think you have the mother of all setups? Now, we all tend to look for the best in life. We all tend to, to do these things. But we also tend to be optimists in life, too, and that being the optimist in life is a good thing. I mean, nobody wants to hang around, hang around with a pessimist. You know, I mean, I thought about being a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out. So you really don't want to be a pessimist, and you don't want to be around a pessimist. But in markets, sometimes you have to be really skeptical. And as I often say, you have to be your own devil's advocate. So do you really, 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 really have the mother of all setups? Do you have something that you think can trade independently of the overall market that could do uh, incredibly well? And if you do, then by all means, take the trade. But if you don't, then walk away but be okay. Now, as I said last week, you have to remember that, especially if you look at a bazillion charts a day like I do, you have to remember that you're going to see some that take off that were on your list. And it's going to sort of, pardon my French, piss you off a little bit, as my little French friend used to say. But Dave, that's English. I'm, I'm half French. I don't know much of it, though. I need to learn a little bit more. I know a little Cajun French. And every night it'll slip out. <laughs> uh, but... You can't have this uh, perceptional distortion, or, or more importantly, I guess a better way of putting, putting it would be selective perception, where you look at that one little fish that got away and say, oh, damn it, I missed it. But no, you've got to look at all the debacle du jours that happened in the meantime, too. And last night I was showing that to my peeps in the service. It was like, okay, guys, yeah, we did have one or two that took off that we didn't take. But look at all these stocks that imploded that we didn't take either. And that's something that's hard to quantify. And I haven't really figured out a great way to explain that just yet, other than if you do get in those losing trades, you have to claw your way back out just to get back to break even. So it's going to take more and more winners and bigger and bigger winners to get you out of that hole. Now, let's take a look at the S&P 500, and what's kind of interesting here is that last week we talked about it, and it has been going sideways since July, and then based on this little slide that we had over the last week, we're now down to where we were all the way back in April. So we're right around 2100 now. And then we were right around 2100 back in November. So as you can see, the market really hasn't gone anywhere in a long, long time. And we're going to flesh out the market action just one second. I just wanted to make a point that we've gone mostly sideways for quite a while. So... And that's one thing I talked about last week. It's like I often say, hey, if the market's going sideways, you, you don't want to, you want to sit in your hands. But sometimes it's not that obvious that it's going sideways. But a week from now, two weeks from now, three weeks from now, three months from now, it becomes obvious that it's going sideways. So if you didn't know anything about markets, at least last week you knew that it was going sideways. And then it would be a little dangerous to jump in, especially on the long side, given the action in more recent times. So you knew it was going sideways as of last week. 
Now, borrowing a little bit from my introduction course, introductory course, I've been working on an introductory course to trading, and it's been really, uh, it's turned out to be a lot more work than I thought it would be. I would just say, hey, guys, this is, uh, this is what you need to know to get started. Uh, any questions? Well, it turned out to be a lot more than that because I began to think, well, what would I want to know, putting myself in the shoes of that punk kid 30 years ago, what would I want to know? And it became more and more about the psychology of trading versus the mechanics. The mechanics aren't that hard, uh, especially like the money management mechanics. But the mechanics really aren't that hard. It does take experience. It does take time. You will have to look at a lot of charts. You will have to put your reps in. I'm not saying that, you, that it doesn't take time. But what I'm saying is the mechanics aren't really that hard. It's, it's the mindset that's key. And that's been coming out. Uh, quite a bit in the uh, in the course now recently I was reading a book by dr. Robert Myra um, and it's uh, the uh, how one small step can change your life and it's uh, it's about Kaizen the uh, concept of making little small changes and I saw him speak a few weeks back at traders for a cause conference which I was uh, also speaking at that conference and he gave a really good speech, and uh, I don't want to go into too much detail on that because we talked about it last week, and then you'll probably see it come out quite a bit in these presentations. So go watch last week's YouTube when you get a chance on that, uh, that I did, uh, or last week's Week of Charts, which is on YouTube. Uh, in the Layman's Guide to Trading, I talked a little bit about mentally rehearsing, and that was back in 2000. Oh, it's been so long. When did that book come out? Uh, 2010, maybe? Um, 2009, I forget, end of 2009, beginning of 2010. Anyway, I talked a little bit about mentally rehearsing before getting into a trade, and I think I was a little bit more specific with that, talking mostly about the money management. Now, the money management. In, this, in the book uh, I just mentioned, he talked about mind sculpting, and he was referring to Dr. Ian... Robertson and I just I ordered the book last week and I read about it and I just got it in recently so I haven't had a chance to read it uh, just yet but I'm sure it'll have something useful in it and I'm sure that it'll find itself into these presentations so if you want to get a jump start on that that's the name of the book Mind Sculpture Unleashing Your Brain's Potential Ian Robertson so my point is that you can mentally rehearse these trades or you can sort of mind sculpt your trades going in and again, I'm borrowing from the introduction course, but one thing you could do is you could see yourself taking the trade. See this trade actually trigger, see yourself taking it. So let's back this out for a second, if it'll let me. So you have this setup. This is what you see the night before. So if you want to mentally rehearse the trade, you're going to see yourself placing an order, see yourself taking the trade. And one thing I talk about is if you lack the discipline, then after the stock opens, then see yourself actually putting in a stop entry order, which you could actually put in and go about your life. I'm trying to get my pen to work here. It actually came unplugged. Let me just plug that back in. Okay. So... As I said a second ago, if you're lacking discipline, then you could actually go in and you can place an entry order, a stop entry order in right here and go about your life. But getting back to the rehearsing, you want to see yourself actually taking the trade with the trade triggers. Imagine that in your head. And if you've done any mentally rehearsing for anything or if you just find yourself thinking about something, you find yourself thinking about some some good food, then all of a sudden your mouth begins to water. Why? Because your brain begins to actually feel these things. You think about something sexual, obviously you, you begin to get a little aroused. You think about something that's bumming you out and you become more bummed out. So you can play these little tricks with your brain and one of them is actually seeing something happen. It's one thing to have something happen and it's another thing to rehearse it and then 
actually have it happen. So you're kind of ready for it. Um, I notice if you ever watch the Olympics, you'll notice you could watch the skier's face. You could actually see him before they actually enter the course going through the entire course. It's very important to do that. And I think the example Dr. Uh, Mara gave was someone that was injured, an athlete that was injured, and instead of just laying in bed, woe is me, recovering, he mentally rehearsed his, uh, I forget if he was a skier or not, he might have been a skier, but he mentally rehearsed his activity over and over and over day because he had nothing else better to do. And that was able to, he was able to recover much faster and get back on the slopes, whatever it was. So you want to see the stock actually trigger. And then you also want to see yourself avoiding the trade. Now, again, getting back to the beginner's course, all this seems kind of basic. And why would I go over it over and over again? And like my wife says, it's like, I say, hey, babe, what do you think about my column? I don't know. You say a lot of the same shit every day. It's like, well, okay. I do, but the reason I do is because people don't get it. And the example that I say ad nauseum, and I apologize for saying ad nauseum for those of you who've been to more than one of these presentations, is the fact that I get emails from people quite often. Hey, Dave, what do I do with this stinker you recommended? I'm down 50%. I'm losing my butt. I never recommended that stock. Yes, you did. We go back and forth a little bit. Finally, to give me a date, or I look through the chart, try to find it, figure it out. Yeah, that was six months ago, and it never triggered. So don't try to outsmart the market by saying, well, Dave says to get in here on a trigger. There's a reason for that trigger. You want the market to prove itself by going higher. As a trend follower, you will be buying higher. You're not trying to catch a bottom. Don't try to rush in and grab it here and then have it completely implode upon you. By the way, that's the beauty of the TKO. This is a TKO example in here. Trend knockout, TKO. There's a lot of times, and I've seen quite a few lately do this, and we've avoided some really bad trades, but we had quite a few lately just implode like this on the next day because if they begin to implode on day one, either it's a knockout move, and that's what the pattern is, a knockout, right, knocking people out, sucking shorts in, or it's the beginning of the real deal. And if it's the beginning of the real deal, the chances of it triggering aren't really that good. So you want to, again, see yourself either taking the trade or avoiding the trade because one of those two things are going to happen the next day. It's either going to trigger or it's not. Now, once the trade triggers, okay, see it trigger in your mind, see yourself actually placing a stop. One thing that's kind of interesting is, and I've, I've talked a little bit about it with you guys, and it's something that I'd probably be fleshed out a little bit more, and I don't want to sound weird or anything, but it's almost like an out-of-body experience sometimes when it comes to placing the trades or making the trades or taking the profits or whatever the case may be, it's like I know what I'm supposed to do and it's like I find myself actually doing it before I have time to think about what I'm doing. And then after I do, I'm like, oh, okay, I know what I did and that makes sense. Not that I'm always that perfect, but it's something that I just kind of realize. And I think what happens is it kind of I'm just kind of trying to think through it as I do these things because like I had one this morning actually did that. It was actually moving nicely in my favor. I found myself saying, hey, let's just leave it all on. But the plan was to take some off and I knew I had this course to do it. I didn't want to sit there and watch the screen all day. So I found myself making the trade and before I do it, I was I I taken partial profits. So it helps to mentally rehearse this, and as you go through your repetitions, you'll find yourself kind of automatically doing these things. And hopefully that made sense. I didn't digress too far. Now, here's the, the negative aspect of this, and you don't want to hope for the negative, but you have to prepare for the negative. Prepare for the worst, hope for the best, right? So say you do imagine yourself triggering that trade and place it at stop, just realize that you could get stopped out. And that's something that I've talked about quite a bit. 
one question I kept asking myself was, why won't people plan their trades? And the answer that came to me was, the moment you plan a trade is the moment that you admit that you could be wrong. And people don't like to be wrong, okay? So see yourself allowing to be stopped out. Don't hope to be stopped out, obviously, but allow yourself mentally to be stopped out. Now, the other thing that you need to do is see the stock, do nothing, see yourself have a stop in place, and see yourself doing nothing. And that's the easiest, hardest thing that you'll ever do because you are a person of action. You need to become a doctor, a lawyer, an automatic transmission mechanic, or if Craig's in here, a dog trainer by not taking action, okay? You trade dogs. When dogs are brought to you, you trade the dogs. Or as Craig says, you train the owner of the dog <laughs> to control the dog. But it's hard not to do anything. Now, obviously, I don't want to digress too far, but obviously there's some things that you could do to make this physically easy, okay? Notice I've got the stop drawn in here, okay? So what do you do while the stock is doing this? Well, Spend some time with your loved ones, go play golf, or do something fun, whatever you like to do. Go sit on your boat, or do what I do, keep yourself crazy busy. Do something else, find some research to do. But do something other than sitting around watching a stock do nothing. The more observations you make, the more you're going to put yourself into a state of regret. Statistically, that's been proven, okay, by people who are a lot smarter than I am. Because more often than not, that trade is going to go against you. I put on a little intraday trade last week or two weeks ago, I forget when, in a Forex. And I would say 90% of the time I was underwater in the trade, and only this morning it started working. Did I feel tempted to get out last week or so? Yes. Was it hard to follow the plan? Yes. But what did I do? I left the stop in place and forgot about it or tried to forget about it. Obviously, I'm looking at the screen. Uh, guilty as charged, okay? I, I watch the screen way too much. But I'm getting better at it. I'm getting better at not watching it, I should say. But don't be like this lady here staring at your little laptop or whatever you're working off of. Go do something. Look for new opportunities. But do anything other than sit there watching that stock go sideways. So during the trade, you want to wait for that entry. No trigger, no trade. Then once it enters, you want to place a protective stop. You want to take partial profits when offered. And then you want to trail your stop higher. And the fifth thing, and that's the hard thing, is to wait unless there are one of the above four things to do. So if ever you find yourself taking action, look back to this list and say, well, which one of these four things am I doing and why? Now, this is a winner from a, from a while back that I've kind of beat the dead horse with. But the beauty of it is it has everything in it, which makes for a wonderful example. And one of the biggest things in it, this turned out to be one of our bigger winners, but there were a lot of times when there was nothing to do, where we had to wait patiently. And then finally, we got the, the initial profit target out of it. I guarantee you a lot of people bailed out day after day after day after day after day after day after day when the stock wasn't doing anything. When you just first look at this chart, it's like, wow, what a great trade. Got it here. Thing went straight up. Well, it went straight up, but over a period of time. And that's one problem, by the way, when you're looking at charts and developing a trading system or trading methodology, however you want to look at it, that you don't realize that each one of those little ticks is a whole day, okay? 
and you may be inclined to watch that stock for a whole day. So this thing took, I'm just kind of eyeballing it, a month to get to that, what we were hoping for would happen in a few days. The first day looked fantastic. It looked like it was off to the races. And then it just kind of died out, okay? But then it finally gets at a partial profit target. So you see yourself taking that partial profit, trailing that stop higher, and then guess what? You go right back to waiting. Look at this. Not easy doing nothing, okay? As I said a second ago, it's the hardest thing you ever do. And then see yourself again trailing that stop higher, and then guess what? Right here, you go back to waiting. The best stocks in the world, as far as I'm concerned, or stocks that turn out to be Darvish style stocks. Now, we don't know they're going to turn out to Darvish style stocks going in, but we're picking the best. We're like in this case, it was persistent. It was accelerating trend. We had a nice knockout move. We had a beautiful setup. It was very textbook in nature, and all the stars were aligned. It was looking pretty damn good. So we took the trade. But we don't know if it's going to turn into a Darvish type of stock. By Darvish, I mean. It makes a box, goes up, consolidates, makes a box, goes up, consolidates, makes a box, rinse and repeat. Those are the best stocks once you're in them because the stock digests its gains, moves higher, digests its gains, moves higher, digests its gains. We all love these parabolic moves like this, but obviously they're not sustainable. And then in the end, you have to be willing to give up some open profits. That's what happens as a trend follower. But you still need to feel pretty darn good about it, okay? If you did this well in every trade, you would own the world quickly. All right, uh, got a letter on what to do with a new situation. Hey, Dave, hope you are well. Question mark, interesting. <laughs> they put a question mark at the end of that. Question mark from, from Mark, a Mark question. Well, I guess given the nature of this uh, situation over here with these two guys, guy and a girl running for president, <laughs> 330 million people in this country, that's the best we could do? Holy moly. Anyway. I think I know the answer, but I need to ask the question anyway. Should anything be done differently in terms of managing stops next week with the outcome of the election? Quick answer to that is no. In the UK, we had a massive volatility. We had massive volatility after the Brexit vote, which swings of well, which swings of well over 25%, which would have taken out most stops on the first day. If a number of shares get stopped out, what is the approach to get back in? Well, the answer, the quick answer to the question is, if you get stopped out, let's say you're trailing a stop, you get stopped out, you get stopped out. The good news is, if you're in longer term trend following mode, and let's say you've been in the stock for a long, long time, and you let that stop widen out to longer term trend following mode, then a sharp sell-off may not take you out. We had some positions, believe it or not, survive the flash crash. It took out, it took us out of most of them, but we actually had some survive the flash crash, and they went on to make new highs. So you want to let yourself get stopped out, and it's human nature to want to do something. But let's say you got a stop in place. You won't let yourself get stopped out because you don't know and you won't know until long after the fact if this is just a knee-jerk reaction or the start of something bigger, okay? Now, I often say if you see a setup, take it. But, I mean, if you see a fantastic setup, something that you really, really like, and you think it's the mother of all setups, then take it. But if you are faced with something like this, some sort of big event pending, then make sure you really like the setup. I'm not saying don't take any trades between now and next Tuesday. What I'm saying is make sure you really, 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 really like the setup. And fortunately, our market over here 
has been doing this, and now it's kind of down here a little bit, a little question mark there. So this is not conducive for a trend trader. So there's no need for us to put on a bunch of positions unless, of course, we think that we have the mother of all positions. You can't start factoring news into your trades because when do you quit? And the bottom line is it's not what you know in trading that usually hurts you. It's what you don't know. It's the, it's the surprise event that comes out of nowhere. A, a, God forbid, a 9-11 or something like that. So I told Mark I was going to cover his question, and he uh, immediately emailed me back. This was right before I, I went live, and it says, um, I think the answer is probably ignore the news. You won't even notice it on a weekly chart in two years' time, or maybe I've watched too many of your YouTube videos. <laughs> uh, yeah, the answer is don't worry about the news. Ignore the news. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't trade the news. And, and I, as I often say, if – Trading was just simply about following the news. A lot more journalists would quit being a journalist and become a trader. Connecting the dots is very difficult. Often the, the reaction is quite the opposite of what you think it should be. He went on to say, however, if you get stopped out on extreme volatility, do you go straight back into stocks as you were stopped out of on a TKO? It depends, and I'm going to flesh it out in one second. Or treat the stock as if you've never seen it before and wait for it to resume trend and wait for a pullback. Uh, the quick answer to that is, uh, yeah, he answers his own question. Treat the stock as if you've never seen it before and wait for it to resume trend and wait for a pullback. Yes, unless, of course, it stops out on something that looks like a TKO, and I'll show you that in just one second. Now, keep in mind, there's always a reason to exit a trade and rarely a reason to stay, okay? Lately, the portfolio, things have kind of weakening a little bit, and you think, well, Dave, let's just get out the way. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Unfortunately, if you do that, you're going to micromanage yourself out of the winners. Now, it's not looking so great today, but yesterday, it actually, we had a pretty good day, and who was to say that it was going to turn right back down um, the day after, or day before yesterday, it was a really good day. Yesterday was not so great. And just this morning, one stopped out. Okay, this is last night's portfolio. So this one looks worse today because it stopped out. And then this one here actually hit the initial profit target this morning. So this one looks better. Okay. So you want to let things unfold, and as I often say, it's a it's a game of outliers. And you never know that next big winner is going to come along. We're just trend followers. We let things unfold, and longer term, we end up pleasantly surprised. Over the short and immediate term, we could find ourselves very frustrated, okay? I find myself very frustrated quite often. But you can't cave into those feelings and those emotions and stop following the plan and start chasing your own tail by chasing the news. Now back to the question. His question was if you get stopped out or he used the term TKO, which is a good which is actually a, a good way to use it. So let's say you are along a stock and you're trailing a stop and you get knocked down on a sharp move lower. Well, if the stock, if that sharp move turns into a TKO, like I've illustrated here, then by all means, you want to go right back in. And I think we did this, and um, this happens on occasion. I'm trying to think of the stock it was, maybe SCTY. I forget which one it was, but it was a stock that was doing fairly well. And then I think going way back, we had some uh, molybdenum, how do you say that? I can never say that word, uh, rare earth stocks that did just that. They, they were just kind of went parabolic. They had TKO moves, and then they went parabolic again. Uh, and, and sometimes these little solar stocks could do such things, and, and little biotechs, and et cetera, et cetera. But you have to honor your stop right here. Even if it just hits your stop and turns around and goes right back up later that day or the next day, because you don't know that it will. You don't know if you're going to end up somewhere way down here. You have to control your losses, obviously, and let your winners ride. So, yes, if on that day it sets up as a TKO, 
then you have to go, you almost have to go right back in. But always take any new setup in and of itself. Allow yourself to get stopped out of any position if the stop is hit and you're not trying to apply a little discretion, okay? And once you're stopped out, then treat it as a brand new position. I think he sort of answered his own question there. So if you're stopped out, and at the end of the day, you look at the chart, and it looks like a beautiful TKO with a nice persistent trend, a nice accelerating trend, all these things I talk about and preach about day in and day out, week in and week out, then by all means, take the trade, okay? All right, questions are stacking up in here. On some of these, I'm going to wait till we get to the charts, if you guys don't mind, because it would be easier to flesh out. All right, John says... Hi, Dave. Or he says, hi, actually. If we, if the start of a new market cycle occurs, a lot of stocks will start trending strongly. In this situation, there are a lot of good trades. Do we just open more trades in order to capture these opportunities? If we do this, the whole portfolio may be exposed to more risk. But if we don't take the trades, will we miss out on these opportunities? Once the cycle reaches maturity, we will have missed out on these opportunities if we don't take more trades. When the chance comes, your thoughts on this? Well, that's the that's the let the ebb and flow control your portfolio speech, okay? And we can go back to the uh, let's go back to the open portfolio. It might it might work for a good example, okay? So we have these stocks on, okay? One, two, three, four, five stocks on. Well, the ebb and flow is. Allow you to be self to be stopped out. So that one comes out. So now we have one, two, three, four stocks on. Okay, so we have four stocks on. This one at the initial profit target. So technically we have three and a half, okay, positions. Four total stocks, three and a half positions because we exit half at the profit target. So let's say you see another great looking opportunity. Do you sell some of these stocks? To buy the next one, no. You go ahead and take that next opportunity and then the next opportunity and so on and so forth. Now, I don't want to try to give too many lessons at once, but let's say you add on, let's just make a whatever, three trades. Let's say you add three new trades. So if you add on three new trades and these trades aren't really working out, okay, and you're, you see a fourth trade, you need to really think long and hard. Do you really want that fourth trade to go on? Now, getting back to the ebb and flow, let's say you do add on these three trades. There are several different things that could happen. Some of these existing trades that are on might continue to take off. Some of these the existing trades that are on might stop out. Okay. So what will happen is you end up making this transition, and sometimes it can be quite beautiful. Not always. I think it was earlier this year. We had some longs. The longs were stopping out. The shorts were triggering in, and the shorts started doing really well, and the longs stopped out, and then we ended up 100% short, and I think that was earlier this year. We were 100% short, so the ebb and flow controlled the portfolio. Well, Dave, if you saw the market rolling over, why not get rid of everything? Well, the answer is because you don't know what might continue to be your big winner. I didn't know that SXCP would hit the initial profit target this morning, okay? It was kind of uh, futzing around a few weeks ago and not doing much, and, and I think it was even in a minus column for quite a while, and it's tempting to bail out on that, but you want to see each position to its fruition. I need to write that down. That might work. It's, it's kind of like a... Uh, Sound like Johnny Cochran. Uh, see his position to his fruition. Ah, we'll write that down. So, yeah, and sometimes the ebb and flow works out. Obviously, several things can happen. And, and, and again, you know, maybe this is where that mind sculpting comes to mind is say, okay, well, either these new stinkers aren't going to work and then the old portfolio is going to take off. Maybe the old portfolio is going to take a dive and these new positions are going to take off. OK, or maybe a little bit of both. OK, and that's where the ebb and flow really kicks in. OK, maybe you do get stopped out a couple of these. Maybe the ones that are defying gravity like this one 
continue higher, okay, and then maybe one or two of these begin to take off and maybe one or two of these begin to stop out. So you have to be willing to let that ebb and flow control your portfolio. Yeah, it'd be great if we could say, all right, everyone, things are looking bad. Let's just bail out on everything, sit on our hands. Now, if you're very, 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 very short-term trading, then maybe that's the thing to do because your risk becomes so – I'm, I'm trying to think of the word I'm looking for, but for lack of a better word, your risk is so great it's not worth it. But we – hopefully, and there's that word hope, dangerous word in trading, but hopefully have the potential for unlimited gains on all our positions, and that's going to take care of the losers longer term, not over the short term. Micromanaging over the short term is often the thing to do to save you the most amount of money, but don't micromanage. Don't get sucked into the siren call of micromanaging because you will never be successful longer term if you micromanage. Now, the problem with the market being a bad teacher is you might micromanage for a couple of years, okay, and think you're doing pretty good with your micromanaging, and then you start to miss the mother of all trends. And the problem is there's psychological problems that comes from underperformance and not getting those big winners. And so micromanagement over the short term will make you feel pretty good. And that short term, like I said, could go for quite a long time. And then a couple of years from now, you develop these bad habits, which have worked out really well, especially the last couple of years. Markets have been choppy. Micromanagement nine out of ten times is the thing to do. Okay. But longer term, you're never going to catch any big winners if you fall in that habit of micromanaging. Let the chips fall where they may. Okay. Resist the urge to do something. And it's hard if you're somebody of action. <laughs> Dave, you say hope. There's no hope in trading. <laughs> we were. I was. I. I had to go to bed. I'm, I'm such an old fart. But I was watching some of the World Series. I'm not a huge baseball fan, but I figured it's it's a once in a eight, a once in a hundred and eight year thing. So I might as well uh, watch and see what the Cubs do. You know. <laughs> and uh, at one point, the Cubs were ahead by a bunch. <laughs> and they panned to some guy in the uh, in the audience up in the bleachers, and it looked like he was crying. And me, me and my wife looked at each other and said, "There's no crying in baseball." So, but yeah, in trade, there's no crying in trading. Just just let it unfold. Okay, I know easier said than done. You know how many f bombs I drop daily? I drop one this morning. I drop I drop them. I'm not proud of this, but I'm still human. I still have a pulse. Okay, but you have to. Learn to embrace that. And as I often say, without digressing too far, I thought I could go one week without saying it. But as I often say, I'm surprised how many times I've gotten pissed off and then go for a walk. And in my neighborhood, that's the block is about two miles. You know, come back two miles later and uh, or whatever, 20 minutes later, however long it takes me to walk, walk two miles, maybe a little longer. And things turn around. Not every time, not all the time, but quite often. And it makes me realize that I put myself through that emotional cycle for no good reason. Donald says, when determining initial and trailing stop levels or using average true range, historical volatility, technical levels such as support resistance, and or some other report, some other approach. The answer to that is yes, 100% yes. <laughs> um, I, did, I, I do quite a few presentations just on stops. Uh, but if you go in to my YouTube channel, and by the way, join the channel while you're there. Uh, it helps. It helps me out. It helps the. It uh, the, the more popular videos are, the more they get seen on YouTube. So please do that. Uh, join the channel. And uh, I don't think you get any emails or anything. You just might get an alert or something if there's a new video up. But I have two videos just on that. But yeah, there's there's a, a plethora of questions you want to ask yourself. I don't use actual average true range because I get that's one of the most common questions I get. But I guess in reality, I do use it because what I'm doing is I'm eyeballing the average true range of a stock, okay, before going in. And if I see it bouncing around four or five points a day, I know that my stop has to be at least greater than four or five points 
but yeah, uh, watch that, Donald. If you have time, uh, go in and watch those two videos, and then I'll I would be uh, I'd be very happy to uh, flesh out any, uh, anything that you need me to anything any further on that. Okay. You're welcome, John. Yeah, you put me up, put me off on a tangent. Imagine that. <laughs> Uh, a couple of announcements. I'm still working on a beginner's course, so uh, if you um, just stay tuned on that, and I think it's going to be more than just a beginner's course by the time I'm done with it because it's it's massive, and there's a lot of good information that I, I keep. I can't help myself. I keep finding myself putting it into the weekend charts. So if you watch the last few weekend charts and you liked them, uh, you've got a good taste of what's going to be in that course. Now, make sure you're at least – on my delayed service, 99.9% .9 of all the examples I use uh, in the weekend charts, both good and bad, okay? Not everything works out, obviously, especially lately. It's been a little bumpy, obviously, and it hasn't been much fun. But nearly everything that you see in here comes directly from the service, so I don't want it to seem like it's in hindsight. So get on a, at least get on a delayed service and begin to follow along. And then in the actual service, I do a lot of the, the teaching on the fly. And I in in my, you know, you're not supposed to say in your opinion, but in my humble opinion, because <laughs> if you're saying something, it's your opinion, right? It makes me nuts. But anyway, in my humble opinion, I think it's good because you're able to see these things unfold in real time, and it makes for a great lesson. And if you're really bored, you can go in and watch the uh, last 12 years' videos, okay? Uh, the question is, are you using closing stops? No, no. You 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 have to be willing to get out intraday, okay? Um, now that, of course, as Murphy would have it, a lot of times a stock will will come back and you'll be bummed out. But let's say you your stop is here, okay? We're not gonna we're not gonna say, oh, my stop is hit, and then at the end of the day, go, oh, it closed below the stop. I got to get out. What we're going to do is we're going to exit when that stop is hit, okay? In the example of EVBG, yeah, that one hit the stop, so that's that's an exit unless you're applying a little bit of discretion, which means that if it kind of comes down and nicks it, turns right back around, then you stick with the position. But if it blows through the stop or hits it and obviously keeps going, then you need to get out. Also, if you're in a stock and it's way up here and you're in longer-term trend-following mode and it hits a stop, you need to just – that needs to be a little bit more mechanical. No questions asked. Get out. Okay. But yeah, you don't want to wait. You don't want to wait to see what happens at the end of the day. Okay. All right. We can go ahead uh, and open it up for any questions or anything so far, and then we can always come back to the slides. Uh, let's let's take a look at the overall market, and then let's flesh out a few things. By accident, Facebook is up here. Look at this. See, this is the this is what I was telling my peeps last night. We have a lot of debacle de jours in this market. And when you start seeing a lot of debacle de jours, it should kind of uh, raise an eyebrow, a eyebrow, eyebrow. All right, as I said earlier, the P's 2100, go way back in time, 2100, okay? So mostly sideways, but you can see that we are beginning to break down a little bit out of a range. Now, when you have a range, if a market breaks down out of a range, it goes right back up. It becomes a bit of a do-over, and you don't have to worry about it too much or as much. Because what happens is by the time everybody realizes that it's breaking down, it's already back in the range, and they breathe a sigh of relief. I think I think there's a delay in traders, especially the, the more inexperienced traders and in, in, in the investors. Investors seem to be trained to where, oh, it'll come back, and then if it doesn't come back, the longer it doesn't come back, the more and more time they have to kind of think about their decisions. So if we bounce right back into the range, I wouldn't say rush out and buy stocks, but we may have dodged a bullet. Now, if we throw the moving averages in here, and let me uh, let me take out a couple and then put them back in. Let me take the 200 out. Okay, you can see we did bow tie down off of all-time highs. Now, this is a negative. Don't get me wrong, okay, because I'm often saying 
Watch bow ties of all-time highs. But notice that we did have a little support, uh, quite a bit of support, still have quite a bit of support just below the market. And then after it did bow tie down, it kind of threw back up, almost went up uh, to the top of the range, and then came back in and just chopped around. So it just kind of developed this sideways range. Yeah, the sell signal is still valid, but we didn't see much follow-through. And now we're beginning to see a little follow-through from that. But it is pushing it to support. Now, what I would watch for is I would keep an eye out for a weekly bow tie. Now, you know, I kind of got way bearish last year and coming early into this year, like we say, we were mostly short because that looked, it really looked like it was going to be the mother of all bear markets. And, and, and in the, uh, by the way, in the Russell 2000, we did drop, which we can look at real quick, we did drop about 20% from that bow tie. So that's nothing to sneeze at, okay? So it was pretty ugly in the Russell. Look at that, 18%. It was 20% net-net. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, on an intraday basis or whatever, high to low. And immediate, the media calls a bear market at, at, at uh, 20%. So by media standards, give or take a little bit, close enough for government work, the, the Russell 2000 was in a bear market in 2015, 2016, based on that weekly bow tie triggering. Now, I don't want to talk about it too much because I talk about it ad nauseum, but as you know, we had major bow ties in 2000, in 8, on a weekly basis in 2000, in 2003, on the buy side, and then a little bit late to the game, 2009, the market still has gone up nicely since. So this one in 2015 didn't really pan out. But what's got, what's got me a little scared is we never did really clear that peak decisively. So if we begin to start bow tying down on a weekly basis, you're going to see Big Dave become a little bit more bearish on you. I'll probably start putting out some more, more of those videos with the bear walking behind me and all this other stuff. But that is looking a little scary if we do begin to bow tie down. Back to the daily chart again. Uh, one thing that I've noticed, and I, I don't pay a whole lot of attention to the 50-day moving average until it actually matters. And now we have quite a bit of daylight below that 50-day moving average. Daylight is just simply the highs or less than the moving average. And then let's clean this up a little bit so you can see it. The highs are less than the moving average. So now we're beginning to get a little daylight. Oops. I don't know how to undo that. Under that fifth. Let's see if we get it back. Here we go. So daylight, meaning the highs are below the moving average. So that's a little bit concerning. Not the be-all, end-all, but if you look longer term, you can see lows are greater than the moving average for the most part in uptrends. And then highs or less than the moving average for the most part in downtrends and we got to go all the way back to when 2008 to see that but simple techniques like that not perfect but they can help to keep you on the right side of the market maybe on a weekly basis a little easier to see notice that this weekly run from 1994 up to 2000 one of the greatest bull markets in history obviously the market spent the majority of, of its time with the lows greater than the moving average. Notice the bear market that followed. Daylight to the downside. In other words, highs less than moving average. Look at that. Just one little kiss <laughs> right there. That's pretty amazing. I'm just kind of, well, I'm re-noticing this for the first time. But look at that. Daylight to the uh, downside. Kept you in that bull market. Oh, daylight to the upside. I'm sorry, bear market. Kept you out on the long side. And then look, upside daylight. Look at that. How beautiful that is. Okay, nothing perfect, but you can see it's it certainly it certainly helps. 2008, look at that, look at that all that daylight. I feel like Tiny Elvis, you know. Look at that lamp, it's huge. Anybody remember Tiny Elvis? <laughs> Gee, Orman, you really wound up today. All right, let's take a look at the rusty. The rusty is a bit of a bummer, no matter how you slice it. Uh, rusty bow tying down off of multi-year highs and all-time highs. Let's get a clean chart on this one. And you can see we're breaking down below the sideways range. Let's clean this up a little bit more. So you can see we've taken out the bottom of the range and just not looking so good. 
in the Russell 2000. That's a bit of a bummer because this is a broadly based index. And you can see, again, break it down below the range. Ideally, you want to see it kind of just a toss back up or throw back up into the range and stay there. Um, anything less, I would be very concerned about the Russell 2000. Now, when you get to the sectors, here's the problem that I'm seeing, or one of the problems. Take energies, for instance. Energies were just popping out in here. And don't get me wrong, I'm a huge fan of relative strength trading, meaning that I want to be in the stronger sectors and the stronger so stocks. But relative strength in and of itself, especially when the market becomes a little dangerous, can be a little iffy. And as Greg Morris said, if you get a chance to read that little, that's a short little one-page article, how I see it article for Proactive Advisor magazine. And I talk a lot about the net-net in there. But as Greg Morris says, as I mentioned in the article, you can't eat relative strength, meaning that if you're in stocks that are going down less than the overall market, then you're not making money. Okay, You can't live off pure relative strength. Yes, relative strength is a wonderful thing. And maybe you did want to be looking at these energies just recently, but then on top of that, you want to make sure they're following through before looking to get in them. So this is a bit of a bummer. We were just at these new highs in energies, and now they've come back in. Other commodity-related areas, such as metals and mining, have been doing the same thing. If I can find them. Here we go. Rebel Energies. You can see they've kind of been working their way higher, but let's not get excited just because they're moving a little bit higher as of late. You can see it's still well below its highs, and it's still chopping in a range. Now, as you go through the sectors, certain areas, a biotech banging out new lows in here, drugs not looking so hot overall. So it's getting dubious at best. Real estate's kind of been imploding as of late. Software sideways at best. Drugs is drugs, banging out new lows. Health services not doing so hot. So get ready to get ready on the short side, especially with the S&P 500 itself beginning to kind of roll over in here. But I don't see any reason to rush out and sell the forum just yet and short like no tomorrow, short with both fifths. If you do think you have a great look and set up on the short side, then by all means, take it. Same thing with the long side right now. But it's going to have to be a fantastic looking setup. And if we could just kind of hold on, not that we're waiting for the election, although we are, <laughs> but if we could just kind of hold on until after the election before putting on a whole bunch of new positions. But Dave, I thought you said don't factor the news in. Well, I'm not factoring the news in, but I'm looking at this market here going mostly sideways and then now becoming somewhat dubious. And that kind of dovetails in with the fact that we're getting ready to have this election. So I'm just getting very selective. If the mother of all trades comes along tomorrow, or tonight I should say, for tomorrow, then I'm going to take it, regardless of this looming election. Okay. All right. Um, any questions on overall market? We'll start looking at the uh, individual stock sectors. Coal is an ETF. Oh, let's take a look at bonds real quick. Bonds, as you can see, have been trending lower as of late, uh, down a little bit today. So this has been putting a lot of pressure on interest rate sensitive areas. As I've been saying quite a bit, especially in the service, for the service people is, with bonds, I think we're going to have a knee-jerk reaction because we're at such low levels, um, low levels interest rate rise, uh, wise, and when those interest rates rise, I think there's going to be a knee-jerk reaction. And I think the rallies have set in that, Rates are still pretty darn low, so let's not get too excited. So once we get that th through that initial reaction, I think we'll be okay with bonds for a while. But if they continue to worsen, then I think it could put more and more pressure on stocks. So bonds only matter when they matter. And again, I think we'll have an initial knee jerk, and then after that, we'll just have to wait and see. All right. Uh, Donna wants to look at coal, uh, Market Vectors Coal ETF. How about the coal ETF on the pullback? Why not? Well, can you draw an arrow on the chart? I don't know. Can you? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It looks good. Okay. 
Uh, volume a little low, but it's an ETF. Sometimes you can get by with these low-volume ETFs. HV a little low, but it's going to be a little low because it's um, an ETF. Okay? Another nice webinar. Thanks, Dave. Oh, you're welcome, Steve. Anytime. What does RP mean? Cool ETF. Back in January, put in a sharp V bottom reverse with a long, brutal sell-off, and it's been... And a strong uptrend, it seems to be predicting a huge victory for Donald Trump. Huge! It's going to be huge! We're going to buy no more coal from China! How's he say it? China! <laughs> yeah, um, and what are we in coal-wise? CNX? Is CNX coal? I forget. I should know these things. Yeah, we're in CNX, which took off yesterday and came right back in, Okay. So I was hoping, and oh, there's that word hope again, but I was hoping that this follow-through yesterday or day before would, would follow through and make new highs, and I'd say, I'd say, you see, this is why you don't sell once you're in. You just follow it through. But, yeah, I agree with you. It looks, uh, looks good. looks uh, darn good. Um, you know, some overhead supply way back here, but that's a long ways away both time and price-wise. So, yeah, keep that on your to-do list or your watch list. Steve says, S-O-R-L is along. S-O-R-L. A little bit or a lot of it on the thin side, Steve. So be super duper careful in that. Uh, what's that? 85. Where's my average volume? I lost my average volume. Huh. I have to get that put back in. So uh, I changed computers. I, it's, I bought a new computer like four years ago. I'm just getting around to putting it in. <laughs> it dawned on me. It was time to buy a new one, Dave. Um no, it's too sideways, okay? And I don't know what the longer-term volume is, but it hasn't traded much today. I don't think I could put that formula back in on the fly, but I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up so I can remember to do it. Uh, no, I remember the net net speech that I give ad nauseum. It's just, you know, it's Janet Jackson now. What have you done for me lately? So uh, in order to get excited about it, see if it can make new highs It continue higher. And, you know, sometimes you will have this net-net issue when the market, when it goes straight up. But in this case, you had this big gap. It, it took off, it got back down. So it's gotten kind of squirrely in here. So see if it can follow through. SMG for Steve, that's going to be uh, Scott something, SMG. Scott's Miracle Grow Company. Um, I would wait for follow through. I mean, the, the volume is uh, volume is good, but the uh, HV is pretty low on this one. Uh, I'd prefer to trade something a little bit more exciting than than Scott's Miracle Grow. But I hear you; it's headed higher. My problem with uh, a well-established company like this in a boring industry is that. It could end up priced for perfection. They probably have quite a few analysts looking at it. They actually have real earnings. They make a real product, a physical product. So being priced for perfection means that the analysts say, well, they should make so much a share. And if they don't, then, or people might expect even more, then it could fall really easy. That's kind of like the go-go nomo. So I think I'd avoid that, uh, especially because it's so low in volatility. SMG is a play on marijuana. Ah. 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 Okay. Interesting. Oh. Hmm. My be darn. John says, legalize it. CRSP or Donald. I guess we better be careful. Not go. I guess we can't go down that road, huh? Uh, this was a little crazy in here. Um, as somebody pointed out, you know, by the way, when market gets kind of crappy and things aren't working so great, you don't have to email me. Okay, I know. <laughs> somebody emailed me a couple days ago. Hey, Dave, those IPO things you've been talking about for years aren't working so well. I know. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, you can see this is a, an IPO. It looked like it was off to the races, came back in. Given the situation in the overall market, see, sometimes IPOs don't care about the overall market. But now, all of a sudden, they do. In markets, things only matter when they matter. And that's kind of a weird, perverse thing that you sort of have to wrap your head around sometimes. For instance, 
Intermarket technical analysis, bonds versus stocks, is a great example. They only matter when they matter. Years ago, you could trade bonds off stocks and vice versa. You can't do that anymore, or at least you can't do it all the time. It only matters when it matters, okay? So right now, IPOs aren't performing as great as they used to, so I would, I would maybe tap the brakes there and focus for the most part, on secondary patterns. So the first early patterns where they set up within like uh, after a week or so of trading, uh, unless you think you have the mother of all setups, I think I would hold off on those for now. And that's a general statement. You know, don't say, hey, Dave, you recommend the IPO a week from now. You know, let's take it on a case-by-case -case basis. But in general, you want to be a little selective in everything, and that now includes IPOs, okay? CLD, I like, Andre. It's going to have to... Um, it's going to have to pull back at some point, okay, to, to, for me to look to get in again on this one. Um, I think I had a position a while back. That's why I said again. Uh, I, I might be confusing it with something else, but I have been watching it. It looks good. So on the next pullback, yeah, absolutely. LNTH. I think that one got choppy lately. Yeah, let's see, it's been too choppy lately. You had the big gap down here, and then, you know, let's go back to that net-net thing. And then, well, I guess you could pick your day, but you get the idea. Down 5% in three months or two months. So, yeah, it's it, it's shot higher, but, again, what have you done for me lately, Janet? It's kind of gone sideways. IGT for a pullback. John's left, so we can talk about him. IGT. I see there's a couple of Johns here. Yeah, absolutely, John. Uh, it's a little on the it's a little on the low HV side. Uh, keep in mind that historical volatility can drop off significantly when a stock persists. So that's probably part of the problem. But it has persisted nicely higher. So yeah, on a on a knockout type of move that could set up as a persistent pullback. Put it on your watch list. Uh, Jim, I like that one, but it's on my list. It's on my Landry list. So out of courtesy from clients, I'm not gonna talk about it. I, we're not going to take the setup anyway, but I, I hear you. Hello, Dave. I'm long uh, ACIA for the $40 and thought it, where would my stop be and uh, would be in trading, has been in trading universe. Yeah, this is something that, this is one we went after, and then I think it might have taken off after we were in it, which is like, womp, womp. Um, yeah, you're long since 40. You should have uh, You should have been stopped out a long time ago, okay? Because it was up here, and I can't measure from the peak, but that's a 45% drop. Uh, even in, in a volatile stock like this, that's a significant drop. So, you know, in perfect hindsight, stops should have probably been at least at the probably around 90 or something. You probably should have got stopped at around 90, maybe a little bit below this base, okay, in here. Uh, trailed it higher, give it plenty of room, like that one we showed a minute ago where it, we gave it like a tremendous amount of room, but you don't want to give it a ridiculous amount of room. So you need to think about being, um, you know, maybe put in a hard stop. It, it, here's the hard part. When you let a stock get away from them like, like this, it's hard to make that final decision. So what I recommend people do is go ahead and put a hard stop in and let that hard stop get taken out. So in this particular case, put in a hard stop somewhere below the market, close your eyes, and let it get taken out. And if it doesn't get taken out, that's fine. ARCH is one I've been watching. Yeah, I like it. Uh, I do like it. it the, you know, high five on this one. Uh, in fact, it's been in a landry list for quite a while. I'm a little bit more selective in IPOs now, so I actually would like to treat it almost like a regular stock or a stock that's been in existence for a while. So I'd actually like to see a little bit more knockout move, but an entry would be above this little pivot point in here. So, yeah, that's a good-looking stock. High five on that one. It's my last third. Oh, okay. So you're doing uh, you're doing some sort of scaling out. Yeah, that just seems a little extreme, even for a trend follower like me. Uh, I don't think that that my stop would have ever gotten that wide, at least at this juncture. So yeah, on your last third, that's fine. And I, I hear you. I mean, I've often thought about what would happen if I built the portfolio over years, where I started with the swing trade. And then I did that longer term trend following. And then after all was said and done, kept the free piece, the so-called free position in the stock and then build a portfolio over the years of free positions. But then 
uh, it kind of goes against my trade or grain, and I just don't think I could do that. So yeah, I hear what you're saying. If you're if you're long from from much lower, you're taking profits out, and then maybe stick with a little tiny piece. But it just goes against the grain as far as trading is concerned. So I'd much rather just trail that stop higher and uh, let it widen out naturally, and then get knocked out when the trend appears to have turned. Okay. Aaron says, do you think IPOs tend to stop out more than average stocks? Seems like most have less volume but more volatile, more risk, basically. Basically. <laughs> I, I knew someone was, uh, was very adamant about telling me how to teach uh, trade stocks, and they kept saying, basically. Um, well, IPOs are more volatile than stocks as a general statement, but you're also going to make – and yes, to answer your question, Aaron, yeah, you'll probably get stopped out more in IPOs. Well, at least given the situation now with the overall market. But a while back, that wasn't the case, okay? Now, what you have to think about when it comes to a more volatile versus a less volatile stock is the more volatile stock within reason is going to give you a much better opportunity. You just simply compensate by trading, trading fewer shares, okay? And I've written quite a few articles on that. In fact, I think uh, if you read under special reports on my website, go to the store and go to special reports. I'll make you walk through the gift store, uh, kind of like uh, at the Vatican and everywhere else, Disney World, Vatican, everywhere else in the world, right? you got to go through, got to go through the gift store. So let me show you where that is on the website. But get that, uh, it's called, um, I think it's called Better the Devil You Know. So right here, go go to store, and then again you have to walk. You have to, you have to walk through the gift shop, and then at the bottom of the page is a free report. So get the one um, on volatility from here. Make sure you read that, and then also watch uh, the week of charts. All the week of charts, we did that quite a bit. <laughs> pie, yeah, pie is one of those ones that we were long that just kind of a. Uh, that's a good example of uh, the trend is the trend is probably ended there uh, because you shouldn't you shouldn't want to, you don't want to ride it out and we had a pretty deep stop in here to get stopped to get stopped out at um, I wouldn't rush out and buy this as a new position in and of itself okay because it's it's retraced uh, quite so much okay but yeah that's one we had a very wide stop on because it had it was beautiful back here right. But we trailed the stop higher and then got knocked out. Donna wants to know about I I V I I V I. Uh, put it on your watch list. Okay, it looks a little thin. I I don't know what the the longer term volume is because I don't have that on this computer. My apologies. I'll get that fixed by next week. Um. But in this particular case, it would actually have to make new highs. And pull back. So put it on your watch list, but it's not ready. Dave, what do you think about you gas here? Well, I'm not a big fan of leverage inverse things, okay, or leverage and inverse things. So let's talk about that. Um, looks like a turning candle daily. Let's take a look at that. What's a candle? Oh, please don't, please don't email me. <laughs> it's like. Sometimes people will tell me something about stochastic, and I'll say, what's stochastic? And they'll send me, like, a four-page email. I'm like, I know what a stochastic is. Uh, UGAS is – this is long, natural gas, but it's triple leverage. Uh, tracking errors occur when you have triple leverage. If you, unless you're day trading, stay away from these triple leverage things. And if you think about it, if it's triple leverage and you're following my system where you're basing that stop on volatility – then three times leverage means you would trade three times, well, I'm sorry, one-third the amount. So you wash out on the leverage, and now you've got the problem with the tracking error and all. So I would, I would pass on that. Um, it just doesn't look good. And you got to be careful on some of these uh, ETFs because uh, – They'll reverse split you to death. You think, oh, well, I'll just buy some on a flyer, right? Because it's look how low it is. It's down here. It goes back to 5,000. It's kind of like those commercials about gold on TV. If it just goes back to half of where it was, you'll make 60%. Yeah, well, if my 
if my aunt had, well, you know the rest of that. She'd be my uncle, right? Uh, big ifs in that sense. <laughs> Uh, no, I would have worn it though. But you know, from a technical perspective, purely technical per perspective, you can see lots of overhead supply. But be really careful. Yeah, drop the F bomb on. Yeah, I did too. Uh, on the one that stopped out. I I B I. We talked about C P L A. Did we talk about that one? C P L A. C P L A. And I don't. You know, I'm not a big candle fan uh, because my biggest problem with candles is that. People try to make something that isn't there. It's like every day is a pattern. And sometimes it's not a pattern, okay? Sometimes every day is not a pattern. So that's my biggest problem with the candle charts, okay? Uh, I started using them years ago because I found they were easier to see and use. But then luckily I hooked up with some old school guys and they happened to be using Western charts. So I just went back to Western charts. Uh, so my only, I guess my only problem with candles is don't try to make, you know, it's always like three birds crapping on a wire or, you know, a baby with a poopy diaper hanging off uh, whatever, hanging upside down, you know. It's always something. And, and sometimes in markets, it's not always something. Sometimes the market is just chopping around. So be really careful with those. Also, the biggest thing, and then Greg Morris, a good friend of mine, he he actually went to, went to Japan and studied candles from one of the masters over there before he wrote about it. I think Nissen's book. Uh, Nissen's first book came out right before his, and, and so uh, I think Nissen got most of the credit with the candles, but uh, Greg was actually in Japan studying them. So uh, one of my good friends does candles, uh, but I just haven't gotten into it. And, and, and even Greg himself will say, a lot of people say, oh, it's a reversal pattern. Well, what are you reversing? If a market's trading sideways and you get that, uh, you know, two birds next to a poopy baby or a baby with a poopy diaper, then... Is it a reversal pattern? Well, I don't know. It might be, but what are you reversing? Are you reversing a sideways action? Yeah, this looks. these educational stocks have really taken off in here as of late. I'm not a huge fan of educational stocks because they tend to be choppy. Uh, but there are a few on my radar right now, and I have to decide on what I want to do with them because, again, I'm just not a big fan of these educational stocks because they, in, as a general statement, they just kind of chop around. Um, and you can see longer term, it's up, it's down, it's up and down. They're Jackie Mason stocks, okay? But for some reason, they're catching a bit. I guess everybody's going to have to go back to school uh, based on the situation in the United States, right? Sorrel, we did that one. Chris, CRSP, CRSP, CRSP. Um, yeah, we did that one. We did that one. CBD, weekly bow tie. That would be fun to look at. CBD. Yeah, um, I'm a big fan of these. Um, uh, well, not a big fan, but Brazilian shares, Latin American shares right now tend to be doing fairly well. And I put the EWZ in the service a couple of days ago as an honorable mention. Uh, I don't see any reason to buy this. Uh, if somebody came up to you tomorrow and said, Dave, you have to make a trade tomorrow, no matter what, I'd say, okay, well, I'll put an order right here for EWZ and I'll put in a stop down around 34 okay 38 34 that would be the trade if there was a trade that had to be made I would do it okay but I don't have to do that I don't have to have action every day uh, there's probably a joke in there somewhere but but yeah these Latin American company are uh, these Latin American companies are looking okay at this particular juncture so CBD let's take a look at that CBD how could it be a weekly bow tie Weekly bow tie? Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a weekly bow. It is kind of a. It is. It is. This is kind of cool. This is like a textbook head and shoulder bottom here. Uh, not that I would trade the head and shoulder bottom, but this is the first thrust on a weekly right here. I wouldn't really call it a bow tie, but yeah, it certainly has uh, has turned the corner. I would call it more of a first thrust on a weekly basis. Let me see if I can clean the chart up and show you what I'm talking about. See, you had this big thrust higher. See, it, the bow tie took a while to form. So this would have been your trade here off the first thrust. And now it's a little late based on that weekly signal. And as a general statement, these these uh, Latin American companies have been doing okay. It looks okay getting to this particular stock. My only problem is it really didn't break out that far past a base. It's already pulled back. And it's kind of like everything. I can kind of pick it apart a little bit. That EWZ looks okay. The more I look at it, it doesn't look as great as it first looked. Okay. 
How deep is too deep? It depends, okay? It depends on the, uh, and this is something that we've covered quite a bit in the weekend chart. So if you can't sleep tonight, watch as many as you can stand. And barring a line from Greg, um, just don't operate any heavy machinery afterwards. But the depth of the pullback depends on the volatility of the stock, the, uh, the, the magnitude of the move. Uh, for instance, if you have a stock, let's say, uh, you know, in the, in the examples that I used earlier, uh, they had some really, this would be a good example here. Um, you want to see something like this, if it'll come up. See, like this right here, you want that knockout or that pullback move to be pretty big. Let me see if I can go back to the prior example that we had. It's even better. It's actually a real example. Yeah, see right here, because this stock kind of went straight up, you want to see this be fairly deep. Now, if this stock was just kind of meandering higher, you don't need as big of a pullback. So the volatility of stock, the magnitude of the move, are two things that you want to look for in the pullback. And again, I got plenty of weekend charts out there on that. So uh, go in and go in and check those out. And if a stock comes up during the presentation, I'll uh, we'll look at it. PBR. Oh, I'd love to have one, Carol. I was in uh, I was in Hong Kong, and to my surprise, they had PBR and a little uh, I don't know if they call them bodegas over there. Yeah, PBR looks good. This is one that's been on my watch list. Okay, this would be the stock uh, scratch that EWZ. If I had to make a trade, I'd take this. Well, either one. Uh, this one looks a little bit better than EWZ. Uh, this, you know, the question about pullbacks, great question. This is deep enough, okay, because you had a really good run in here. Uh, Percentage-wise, that's a pretty big run based on the volatility of the stock, 34%, probably 40%, low to high. Nice little pullback, obvious pullback. So, yeah, high five on that one, Carol. I think that's on my lander list, though. I should be careful uh, throwing it out. But what's going on with the energies? Eh, the energies are not doing so hot. Yeah, Latin American companies are doing okay. Uh, this is a Latin American com com uh, company. I would give it an okay. If I had to make a trade, EWZ or this one, toss up, probably this one a little bit better than EWZ. Good eye. I think it looks good. It's uh, accelerating higher. It's persisting higher. Nice deep pullback, uh, the question AJ was answering, plenty deep enough on, on this particular case. But what's the overall market doing? Eh, not so much. What's the overall sector doing? Eh, not so much. So a little tough for me to take that particular trade at this juncture. Now, tune in tomorrow, next week. You might actually see it on the list. Uh, Jim, that's actually on my list for today. Not that we're going to take it, as I just said, but uh, let's just stay off the lander list. We can help it. Ren has been one I've been watching, AJ, and uh, that's uh, one of these um, uh, energy stocks. Now, in this particular case, this pullback is, is I, I would say, on the cusp of being too deep because it came all the way back to its prior little breakout level, okay? Uh, a few days ago, I liked it, but now that it's all the way back down here, I would say it's on the cusp of being too deep. Also, one, two, three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's now 12 days into the pullback. So at that juncture, based on the depth and the number of days, I would begin to think that this stock is a little bit uh, too deep for a pullback for my taste. But, you know, two days ago, up around 25, it looked a lot better than it does today. Okay. Has the Donald mentioned Brazil? I think not. Maybe safe. <laughs> Phil, uh, I, I think I asked you this, but who, you know, just from the U.K., from the U.K.'s perspective, who do you guys, do you guys think one guy's going to win over the other over here? You think uh, Donald will win? ABEO, did we talk about that one? I think we did. CPLA, we did. Yeah, MTL. MTL was the one that was on. This MTL was the fish that got away, but I'm okay. Okay, and it's hard. It's hard to to see a stock set up like it did back here and not take it, okay, based on the overall market, based on the overall sector, and then based on the action, especially in so many different stocks, and then watch it take off without you. Um, I think it's a little too crazy now. It's 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 gone from what uh, a buck to five bucks. What's that? Four or five hundred percent run. You know, it would have to have the mother of all knockout moves, but I think I would pass based on it now. It's 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 too late. After Brexit, who knows? <laughs> you guys have given up predicting the outcome of uh, 
elections, huh? That's funny. Okay, any more questions? We've got a few minutes left. We could probably squeeze in a couple of more. You guys want to do that? Here's your, um, I, I'll probably make this the, um, I forget where we got triggered in this one, probably back here somewhere. Um, this is the mother of all dead money examples. And then finally taken off in here. Miners are setting up. Um, depends on the miner. The uh, Maybe some of these coal stocks that we talked about earlier. Uh, if we go to the Morningstar industry groups, the base metals are doing much better than the precious metals as of late. So let's take a look at some of these real quick. So metals and mining overall really doesn't look that great, okay? It's kind of sideways at best going back, what, three months, okay? So overall, not so hot, but certain areas have been doing okay, at least on a relative strength basis, and there's that word, relative strength again, okay? Uh, copper, not so much. Steel looks, steel looks a little bit better. Aluminium, not so much, as my friend over the pond, across the pond says, aluminium. But these industrial metals are kind of doing okay. Gold and silver, not so much, okay? So maybe steel within the mining companies looks okay, and then maybe coal. I don't have any specifically for coal. Uh, I think CNX is a coal stock, though. Yeah, SXC is going to be uh, now, SXC is the new SXCP. They're buying out SXCP. So, uh, yeah, this looks pretty good. And uh, I think it's good. I think it has potential longer term. Okay, so we're long. We're long SXCP, and this is XXC, and they're buying out SXCP. Okay, and I guess they own some shares to begin with. A uh, little bit deeper pullback in this particular case, but yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we are long full disclosure, but. I think it has potential. Felp is a potential uh, coal stock. Yeah, the problem with Felp is it pulled back in below its breakout levels. Uh, maybe keep it on your, oh, that's ELP, never mind, Felp. Uh, Felp, yeah, it looks okay. A little bit deeper pullback, kind of thin on the volume, though, and a little choppy, but, yeah, super thin, so be careful with that. A little bit deeper pullback, um, maybe. But again, I'll need that average volume to analyze it. I just don't have it on this one. Copper just broke out of a triangle. Give me, what's the symbol in copper for the, um, what's, I forget, what is it, copper on the, uh, what's a copper ETF? Copper, 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 copper. Copper is JJC? It's an ETM. Be careful with that. It's a JJC. JJC, Phil says. Yeah, um, I'm not a big fan of triangles, but I hear you. See, when I see this, I just see wide and loose, and I see a big-ass base, okay, and then wait for the breakout. I guess the big-ass base because uh, somebody in the TC group used to call it a J-Lo bottom if you had, like, two big, bo two big double bottoms. Uh, CNN can I don't have that symbol V O V E O L V E O L I don't have that one either V D L oh my eyes are gone uh yeah this is uh it says steel and iron I don't know if it's got coal in it or not um. But, yeah, some of these selected areas, I mean, like I said, we're long CNX and SXCP, but we've been long for a while. We didn't just rush into these recently based on the recent action, okay? Uh, yeah, on a pullback, that looks pretty good. It looks like a foreign stock to me, and the volume looks a little low, but uh, it looks okay. Yeah, AJ, that one's on my list for today, so I can't talk about it, even though we're not going to take it, but still, it's just out of courtesy to my clients. Uh, VEDL, we look at that one? Yeah, we're looking at that now. Can, I don't have that one, Don. You're welcome. 
Howard says, Reverend Dave, thanks. <laughs> All right, looks like we're out of time. Uh, guys, uh, thank you so much for showing up today. I'm humbled by your appearance. Looks like we had a good crowd. Must have, The links must be working again, so uh, fantastic on that. It was enough headaches there. Anyway, uh, any unanswered questions, daviddavelandry.com. If we don't talk between now and the weekend, uh, Phil, uh, everyone have a great weekend. And uh, if you do have any questions, shoot me an email. And uh, it's next week, are we having a show? Um, yeah, I think we're having a show next week. The following week, try to make a note, uh, is um, I'm headed to Vegas for Traders Expo. If you are in Vegas, join me. It's free. And as people say, often say, it must be good because Dave, people often say Dave's good for nothing. Um, and then the week after that is Thanksgiving. So we're going to have a little break in here coming up soon. So just an FYI, heads up on that. Anyway, uh, thanks again, everyone. Have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk again, I'll see you all hopefully again next week. Thank you so much.